Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul with RP1 series in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 and in this episode we are going to start off with a contract to put two Kerbals into orbit and move them from one orbit to another orbit. Basically it's a Gemini mission and I unlocked the Gemini capsule. Uh, that was very expensive by the way. And But we have money so I decided to go for it. And it is a little bit tough to run. I mean, uh, when you take a look at the rollout cost, 98,000, uh, 20,000 base cost here. Uh, all the crewed missions are pretty horrible on the rollout. And um, yeah, so what we've got inside as the service module is a whole bunch of solar panels because the Gemini uh, capsule takes two kilowatts. It shouldn't, by the way. I'm not, that's not really the power draw, but I think they sized it based on the fact that fuel cells produced 2 kilowatts. Um, but of course, there's a safety margin on that, so it shouldn't be that the cabin actually consumes that much, and it consumes way more than any other cabin in the game, uh, buying the space shuttle maybe. But uh, yeah, I mean, compared to the Mercury capsule or the Mark One pod that we were using, that only used 530 watts. So it's a pretty big power draw here. And in fact, even these solar panels aren't going to be enough to supply it completely. We'll see how long they, it can go for. But um, eight of these, each of these is only 170 watts or so. Um, I was tempted, 178 watts. I was tempted to use one of these, well, not one of these, a lot of these uh, XT2s and maybe even tweak scale them up so that they could supply the power properly. Uh, we'll go with this for now and see how it works. This is an AJ-10 Advanced. First time we're using an Advanced. Are they more reliable than the mid? I don't know. I've heard rumors that they uh, were trying to make them less reliable. Uh, but fortunately, I have not updated to any more recent version of Realism Overhaul where they would want to do that. So hopefully these are more reliable, maybe. Anyway, AJ-10 118F with unlimited ignitions and no rated burn time. And that's realistic, actually. I mean, uh, they're, you know, sort of closely related to the AJ-10 190s on the shuttle, which had like a thousand starts and, and more than 20 minutes of rated burn time. So, yeah, this is an empty tank right now because we don't need it. And I didn't want to supply a launcher that could loft such a heavy tank. Um, so all we've got are these tanks here. These are high pressure tanks and so is the one that the AG-10 is attached to. But these high pressure tanks have a fuel mix that are meant for the backup propulsion system which is a set of four 2 kN thrusters. And so that's these here uh, on Arizona N204. And so it's not the right fuel mixture for the AG-10. The main tank has the right fuel mixture for the AG-10 as does this small tank here. Now the main tank is a balloon tank. Uh, uh, type 3 balloon tank uh, but uh, we have the high pressure tank here so that uh, reads us pressure fed down here uh, that's a little bit tricky cheaty if you will but then again they haven't figured out how to stop me from doing that so I'll just keep doing it uh, well at least in this particular case it made sense because of tooling um, if I had already tooled a uh, tank 3 of this size I would have just used that but I hadn't <laughs> so I didn't have a good tank 3 service module size. I have money, but you know, if I can get away with this, why not get away with this, right? Okay, so and of course we have the retro package up here as usual, a lot of RCS fuel. Uh, everything's a tape. Uh, I sized this a little bit smaller now, and I actually tooled that tank. I mean, it's uh, shocking, you know, when I actually tool tanks. These are my type 1 tanks, just for reference, type 2 tanks. No, the type 2, uh, the largest diameter I went to was 1.2. Um, type 3, just that one, just this one. And uh, the balloon tank, just this uh, 2 meter by 2 meter size. It's actually shaded a little bit lower. But yeah, that's all I've got. So anyway, we're going to do, uh, do a test with this. It should be sufficient to fill the contract. Even if the AJ-10 doesn't work because we're using those 2 kN thrusters. It'll just take a lot of time. And uh, we've got four engines at the bottom, but we're going to shut two down because otherwise the thrust weight ratio gets really high. Uh, unfortunately, the thrust weight ratio is going to get high with the LR-105 stage, but that's been true so far anyway. Well, that's partly 
uh, the case because we're so light up there. But yeah, all right. Uh, we're going to queue one of these up and then send two Kerbals up into this orbit and then that orbit. And all together, we've got 10 days of supplies. I don't know what it means by three days and five days, if we have to stay up there for three days and five days. I don't know if we have enough power for that. We might have to slap some more batteries on here in order to do that. We'll see. Okay, so that is the situation. And save and build. So we're doing this while we wait for the Mars transfer window. The Mars transfer window is in 79 days. That's why I picked up this contract so we'd have something to do in the meantime. And again, we're probably gonna have to do more than one try on this because of the power situation. 39 days to build it. Yeah, we can get two in maybe. Uh, but we do have to build all these Mars missions and their backups. As far as getting a new launch pad, I don't know. I'm, Maybe I should rename this one. Let's just rename this uh, 600 ton. Because <laughs> that's what it's going to be in a bit. Uh, once the upgrade finishes, we've got that, that upgrade finishing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, 600 tons. If I want a new launch pad, uh, 10,000 funds. I guess so. Okay, and then we have to build the second launch pad in two days. That's fine. If only NASA could build a launch pad in two days, you know. Uh, well, 20 tons is not going to cover anything. We'll need to get that up to 100 tons. I mean, we can see a Piper 2 here. It says 10,000 here. and we Oh, wow, look at that. On the 600 ton pad, it's 23,000. On this one, it's only 10,000. Maybe I shouldn't... Well, I, I, the, they, they won't fit on this pad. I think they're more than 60 tons anyway. Yeah, we need 120 tons for this one. And for the A versions, those are heavier because I add one booster. Yes, I'm finally going to use an SRB, folks, in my favorite configura configuration of SRB, which is, of course, putting one booster on the side. <laughs> we'll see how that works out for us. It's just one caster to give us a little boost at the beginning. All right. So... We'll need to upgrade that other pad one more time. I don't know why the size of the pad should change the cost. But, uh, okay. Um, maybe I should just upgrade this pad up to 300 tons and go with that. Because the Valiant X is going to need that. And that'll be a big cost savings, I think. So they'd really like to nickel and dime you all over the place. This is really... It's like selecting options in an airliner. Uh, but the uh, 150 ton pad is going to take too much time to actually upgrade. So we'll launch... Uh, let me get even a new pad. Yeah. Oh, wow. The pads cost more to build when you need a new one. The first extra pad was only 10,000. Now it's 19,000. Why? Why? I mean, it's the same stretch of swamp. Uh, we, we're we building it, you know, very close in time to the other one. It shouldn't cost more for the next one. But, okay. Well, we actually have to get this up to 150 tons. Okay, lots of upgrades, lots of stuff. But anyway, uh, 600 ton launch pad with the Valiant X. Okay. We will see. Let's review our requirements for the contract. Doesn't have any inclination. And the periapsis just has to be above 160,000 and an apoapsis, let's say 400,000. And we have to increase the apoapsis to... 1,000 uh, 1, kilometers. So 400 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers. It looks like we'll have to handle the Mars missions before we launch a second attempt at this. All right. Um, I think Philippe needs some time off. Let's say Daffry. So Nake and Daffry. All right. Well, I don't want to have them sitting out on the pad for no reason. Uh, so I'm not going to time warp to morning or anything. And 
Let's see, everything seems to be all right. Throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. Initial thrust weight ratio of this is 1.76, so. I've gotta see if ditching procedural fairings for everything solves the shader problem on the fairings. I might have to retool fairings, but it's always so annoying. And only with procedural fairings for everything have I ever seen that. Okay, we're gonna get ready for shutting down two of the engines. Okay, two engines shut down. We're on two engines now. Still should be well within the rate of burn time of these engines, by the way. Okay, good burn on the first stage, second stage. We have lots of margin to get to orbit. I mean, you'd expect that considering the Gemini spacecraft originally launched on Titan and this rocket has roughly twice the initial thrust of uh, Titan. I mean, a little bit less than that, but it's about the same mass, I think. Oh, I just noticed. I guess the AJ-10 Advance doesn't have a test flight configuration at all. Maybe that's what they meant by reducing the reliability of it, because it's now infinitely reliable. I guess that's fair. But for now, I don't have to worry about test flight with the AJ-10 Advanced. That's nice. I wonder if there's ever been a failure of the AJ-10 Advanced. I mean, the AJ-10 on the top of a Delta II, basically. I mean, Delta IIs have failed, but that's a separate issue. Okay, I think I'm gonna dispose of this stage. Uh, barely. Alright, separation. And... Whoa, oh! Uh, that was very, very scary. I, I hate these upper stages that explode and give me a heart attack. Why? Why does that have to happen? It doesn't really throttle. Oh yeah, we have to get to a higher apoapsis. Isn't it nice to be able to reignite it without thinking that it might not reignite? Alright, well that's our first orbit, isn't it? Um, let's see... Yeah, it's counting down. So we have to stay three days here and then five days on the upper orbit. Yeah, I mean it's not really recharging on the daylight side. We're just gonna have to bring them back. I don't think we're gonna get through the three days. So... I need to unlock better solar panels, basically. Either that or use those other ones that I've got. But let's see, we're gonna be passing over Australia, so we'll be doing the retro burn here. It'll just be a one orbit test. We have retained the lunar rated heat shield on here in addition to the capsule zone ablator. So we've got double heat shielding right now. We are uh, I guess we can jettison the nose cone now. That, of course, frees up the parachutes and everything. I really wish the Gemini cabin had more reasonable power consumption. It's not like they could fit that many electrical systems in that thing in the first place, jeez. Okay, trunk is off. Oh, tumbling. We don't really need descent mode, but I'll just go ahead and do descent mode. Uh, somebody asked what the roll is for. Um, if you're oriented at zero, uh, you're gonna get lift. And so if you're not careful, then you're just gonna skip out of the atmosphere. I roll over to 180 
uh, after much pleading by my audience, by the way, I didn't used to do that, and they said, please do it. Uh, okay, I, I was worried that uh, Kerbal does not like to control roll very well, but it turns out it does this well anyway. Uh, if you've ever tried to launch a rocket and tried to control roll on launch, it doesn't do that well there. But uh, yeah, so roll over 180, and it'll sort of keep you at that altitude so you don't gain lift and won't skip out of the atmosphere, basically. Yeah, I was very much afraid of using roll during re-entry because, you know, things could explode. If it wobbles too much, the top could explode, and that's where the parachutes are. So I tended not to do that. But there was a lot of skipping out of the atmosphere with that. So as you can see, this way uh, with roll zero, it'll get lift and you note the vertical speed approaching zero. I mean, that's also because we're approaching our peri... Well, we're not really approaching our periapsis. The whole descent mode thing and rolling over, that's more important for coming back from the moon anyway. Um, this low Earth orbit trajectory, you don't need to worry about that. You could just keep it like this. Honestly, the Gemini cabin doesn't seem to tilt as much on descent mode as the Mark 1 cabin does. Okay, passing over Florida now. There's Tampa Bay. So we should be pretty close to Cape Canaveral when we splash down. Okay, we are through the worst of it. Nearly gave them a Bahama vacation. Alright, and full parachute deployment brings us to 6.5 meters per second, which means it's about the right amount of parachute, so no skimping on that one. Okay, recover vessel. We did get a world's first for two crew, but obviously we didn't fulfill the contract. And I think we'll wait until we're through all the Mars missions before, Mars launches, before we try and fill that contract again. Well, we'll have to because the rocket won't be built in time. Uh, looks like they'll be out, well, Daffrey's out for two weeks, Nake's out for a month. See, it is random, they had the same mission, so I don't know, yeah? Alright, whatever, either way is fine. Uh, they'll be ready when I need them. And uh, our pads hopefully will be ready too. Anyway, let's get started on building a new one. Uh, but I need to, well, we need to check out where we get better solar panels. I need to replace those solar panels first of all. Well, it seems like improved power generation and storage relies on this advanced capsules era electronics research. I don't know if we need improved communication. I mean, I guess we could just put like that Pioneer 5 probe on, no, <laughs> I was just joking, uh, Pioneer 5 probe on top of it and use its solar panels, but no, that's still not quite enough. Okay, um, so let's advance that research and make sure it's done quickly. I don't really need the 1966 orbital rocketry just yet. We just got the 1963, 64, and 65. But first, all the Mars missions. I do have another upgrade point. I'm going to use that. And let's see if there is a crossover point where the rate of the second one matches the first one and goes past it. So I guess this is how it's supposed to be. Okay, well, fine. Um, I just want a round number. I don't want all these digits. There we go. That That's fine. One-tenth. All right, I'll take that. We just have one more of the Mars missions. We got five altogether. And then we have one hanging out in orbit waiting for the transfer, of course. And so, yep, we've got lots of opportunities. Test flight will kill half of them, maybe. And then we'll see. I think we should start launching them now, now that the pad is complete. So we're going to use this 150 ton pad that we just upgraded. And that should be enough for all of these pipers. So, and that will save us quite a lot. Um, so the big pad, it'll take 23,000 and this small pad, 13,000. I'm gonna try a Piper 1A and that has one of the boosters. 
This vessel did not pass the ed editor check. Size limits exceeded? Uh, okay. Wait. It's too tall? For the pad? It's too tall by 4 meters. Okay, well, hold on a sec. Well, we might have to replace the balloon tanks with uh, one of these Titan 1 upper stage fuel tanks, considering those have, you know, they're bigger on the inside. wonder how much time it would take to replace this with uh, AJ-10 Advanced. Heck, it says only 46 minutes to change out the engine and change the tanks completely. Beats me what it actually takes time for. We also took off a probe core. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't put the fairing on. Maybe it'll completely change everything on me when I put the fairing on. So we'll have a more reliable engine. Uh, this says only four ignitions though. Hold on. Why does it say lack tech for AJ-10 118F? When we have the AJ-10 118F and we just used it. I don't understand. We just used that engine on the other mission with the crew. I'll do the same for the other missions. No need to have the worst AJ-10 on them. Okay, so I pretty much edited all the Piper rockets so that they're a little bit shorter and hopefully those edits don't cause other problems, uh, potentially not having enough fuel because I did reduce the size of some tanks. And uh, yeah, we will see, but we've got some ready and so I'm going to roll out this Piper 1A and we will see if that works. And yes, I figured out that the number in parentheses means the number of upgrades for the launch pad. So. We are rolling out to that 150 ton pad and we will see if that goes well. Okay, we're going to figure out whether this one booster on the side configuration is okay for this rocket. Of course, I've done it with an Atlas V before, but uh, this is not the same, so we'll see. But then again, the Caster 1 does not last very long. It's hardly worth it, to be honest, but anyway, uh, it is here now and we're going to use it. So, without further ado, ignition, and launch. Yep, okay, let's see if MechGen can do a good job. I mean, the booster lasts for such a short amount of time. Okay, well, we'll separate it. Off it goes. Was it worth it? No idea. Okay, NK-9B time. Might have just enough to make orbit on this stage. But we do have the AJ-10 advanced up there. Four ignitions though. So, maybe... Uh, I, uh, some of them I left the mid on because for some reason I now can't pick the configuration that has infinite ignitions on the AJ-10 Advanced. So the AJ-10 mid does have infinite ignitions though it doesn't really let me use them uh, most of the time. It's, it's sort of complicated. Do I take the four definite ignitions or the infinite possible ignitions? <laughs> I mean... I don't even know what the ignition limit means when you it says infinite but you can't get more than four out of it, right? I mean, doesn't that mean that it's uh, ignition limited to four? Functionally, it does, and uh, in terms of certification, that's what it means. So, it's sort of silly. In a weird way, test flight and and the ignition limit are giving contradictory information. Either it was certified for a certain number of ignitions or it wasn't. If it's certified for a certain number of ignitions, it had better be able to ignite for those number of ignitions. Because there was a safety margin on that, there was all sorts of checks. They probably tested 
reigniting it for multiple times more than what it was certified for. So it should not fail to ignite for those amount of ignitions. That's just how it ought to be. Otherwise they should have certified it for fewer ignitions. Okay, I could have handled that orbit a little bit better. Alright, separation. RCS on forward. And ignition. A bit of lopsided orbit. I could have coasted, but this will be fine. So that's one ignition. We just need one more in order to get us over to Mars. And we've got 4, 000, nearly 4,400 meters per second, which should be enough. This mission doesn't need to use propulsion to capture, is that right? Or, no, this is a propulsive capture one, so we do have to pay attention to that. 141 days is too quick, so this will probably be one that takes a lot to capture. Yeah, I can feel it. Uh, yeah, that's a 5,000-er. Uh, let's see if we can get Megjeb to give us something that takes a little bit longer to get there. Still thinks that departure in 81 days will be better if we want to take our time. Which is sort of weird. Doesn't seem to really be popping up right. Let me just plot it on my own. Fine. I, 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 I'm not feeling like Mechjeb is giving me the right stuff. Okay, yeah, like for the other mission, we're gonna need two ignitions from the Sage 810. We're going to need. An initial one of 3,400 or so, and then another one for a mid-course adjustment of 800. But we do have that Delta V. It doesn't boil off, and it doesn't have a test flight configuration, so we do have the three ignitions. And then we will approach Mars, and it'll take about 2,700 to make orbit, which our upper state, the little probe has. The probe has 3,000. So that is the plan. But we have to wait an hour, and we should probably get our solar panels out. And tune the antenna, of course. We will still have to hope... Oh, wait, I do have... Uh, no, no, I didn't put the commutatrons on this one. That's the heat shield ones that have the commutatrons. We appear connected for now. Let me just see whether that's likely through our burn. Um, it's a stretch, but it's not a long burn, and there are other sites over here that we can acquire. Okay, hopefully that'll work. Just barely outside of the atmosphere, starting to fuel down again, and ignition. We'll decide exactly what orientation we want at the mid-course adjustment. But for now, this will do. And we have the Delta V. So all is well. We're currently in the dark. Once we are in daylight, it should replenish electric charge just fine. Yes. And the dish is tuned for Earth. So let's add this mid-course adjustment and launch another one. Okay, this launch is one of the heat shield ones, one of the atmospheric probes that we're actually going to try and land on Mars. But we also have one of the AJ-10-104s, so test flight does handle it, but it does have infinite ignitions in theory. And I've decided to line up a little bit differently this time, just a little bit off from last time to see what the effect is. And so, well, we will see. Thrall up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. This time, no side booster, of course. So there is some variation to our launches, even though for the most part the Mars launches are similar. I might have to consider, since the timing seems to be very free, in other words, there seems to be an opportunity, according to Megjeb, two months from now to launch to 
Mars, which seems weird, but anyway. Um, if that's the case, then maybe I can launch something bigger on that window. Especially once we get the better solar panels. And we could see if that is a good idea. Something like a fuel depot around Mars, you know. Okay, separation. Oh, NK9V vapor and feed lines. Oh, we haven't had that problem in a long time. Okay. Interesting. Well. No, that's that's all not going to work. All right. Maybe we can recover this because it's got a heat. Well, I mean, it's not even going that fast. Of course, the parachutes are configured for Mars, not for Earth. But that should be okay. Maybe. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't really had to use ullage motors. I guess we were a little bit late on the NK9V ignition, and that's why. But so far, the need for ullage motors has not arisen for a while. Okay, yeah, these Mars parachutes are sort of OP for Earth. But I can't cut one set in order to speed our descent, so I guess I'll just have to physical time warp and wait. Okay, it's taking a bit of time, but finally we'll recover this bit. And, you know, it's a somewhat expensive bit, especially the solar panels. They're really expensive. The core is probably pretty expensive, too. Okay, well, we got 4,867 funds. So yeah, uh, it was worth recovering. I guess we'll try another one. Okay, we're going to try again with uh, Heat Shield 1, an atmospheric probe. Throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. And this time I'm going to have to activate that NK-9B promptly. Assuming it works, even in that case. This time, though, the upper stage is an AJ-10 advanced, so no test flight woes. Okay, holding steady and getting ready to ignite promptly. Ignition. Okay, we're good this time. Possibly also a steeper trajectory helps because then we're not facing as much atmosphere pushing on us, I don't know. Okay, we'll need an ignition out of the AJ-10 advanced, and we only have four, so... Okay, 192 by 180, and we've got 4,280 meters per second left. Before I forget, let me extend things. Transit duration 168 days doesn't seem too bad. Let's see how much Delta V it takes to capture with that. Oh, it doesn't matter about capture for this one. Okay, yeah, we, we don't need a mid-course adjustment. We can just go directly. Yeah, but out of curiosity, what would it take to actually manually capture, I suppose? For future reference, 168 days, still pretty quick. Anything less than 180 is very quick and requires a lot more Delta V to capture. Oh, that's, a, that's only 3,000 right there. So yeah, that's a pretty good opportunity. We might want to consider that for another one. We've got another Piper 1 without the heat shield, uh, just the orbital probe. And this might be a good setup. But again, we don't need it for this probe. Okay, fuel settled and ignition. Okay, let's see what's going on. Oh, pretty close. All right, and so a little bit of RCS maybe. Okay, well, of course, we want to dip into the atmosphere, but that. Uh, it's tough to get it exactly right right now. All right, uh, that's probably good enough. 
Okay, so what we want is a dummy maneuver here so that we can get an alarm right there because right now the SOI change would be Earth's SOI out to solar SOI. We have some extra fuel for corrections once we get there in case we need to be on the other side for communications. And everything looks good except Earth is a little bit buggy right now because of scatter. So we'll look at it up here and it is recharged. And we've now got a full set, if you will. We've got one probe that can definitely take care of um, the Mars orbit and one that can take care of the Mars atmosphere. Now, instead of launching another one of these, let me actually, and turn off the RCS here, let me uh, take a look at that probe that we left in, oh, is it fixed? No, it's not. Um, take a look at that probe that we left in orbit, you know, this Piper 1 here, and just see if we can uh, do its maneuver a little bit earlier instead of in six days and just get it over with. Okay, I have a replot for this one and we will get it on its way finally after a 73 day wait in low Earth orbit. So it'll cost 3,500 here, 800 on the mid course correction, and then 2,400 to capture. Okay, we are on escape and getting ready for shutdown. Shut down. All right, let's just do it as advertised. One nice thing about using the AJ-10 Advanced instead of the mid, of course, is that the RCS uses the same fuel. Problem for using the mid because it uses UDMH and nitric acid and we don't have RCS that do that. Okay, so obviously a little bit off here, but hopefully not too far off. Um, RCS can stop puffing. 364 kilometers seems fine. And then how much to capture? 318 day transit. So that's 2,272. So basically 3,100 altogether, maybe a little bit more than that. Then we have 3,500, so we have enough and we can add this mid-course adjustment into our alarm clock and this one's on its way so we're doing pretty good so far and we'll check on it its power is the same as the others so there shouldn't be any problems there either but yeah i think i'll leave the episode here uh we'll probably toss up a couple more mars missions but we need to do that orbital flight with maneuvers and two plus crew of course just two crew and uh, that's the next contract we need to worry about after that uh, we'll see what we can do with our new 600 ton pad and perhaps we can launch some more robust lunar missions a lunar landing That'll take a few pieces, we'll see. And I would like the Lunar Gemini Lander engine. We could get that. In fact, let's, oh, no connection. Huh. I mean, there's no ground station within the cone. Well, let's follow this a little bit further to see what's going on. We've got, I guess it's a pretty narrow cone. It doesn't really matter that we don't have connection right now so long as we have it when we're at Mars. Well, we got a brief connection there. Every now and again, we'll get a bit of a connection, but by the time we get to Mars, that cone will cover all of the Earth, so we should be okay. All right, uh, yeah, let's go back to the tech tree. So, 1966 orbital rocketry, and the only reason I wanted to go up this line is because 1967 to 1968 orbital rocketry is required for lunar landing, which has the Lunar Gemini Lander engine. And of course, a lot of other interesting engines for lunar landing, but yeah, we need this. So let's research that and queue that up, make sure we have the science working on that. And I would like a J2, so yeah, um, that seems like a good thing to spend on. And I'll save the rest for at need stuff, like we needed the power generation here. We might need some of this other stuff, but I'll see what we need first before using that science. So that's what we're unlocking, and that's where we are in the tech tree. 
And with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.